Hello everybody, and welcome back to Daniel's Side of the Story, where I just go through that week's chapter of the story, and I just give a few of my different thoughts and my reflections for that chapter. This week, we're on chapter 11, and we're taking a look at King David. And in this chapter, there's there's so, so much that I could talk about, and I was actually going to talk about something different, but just this morning as I was... I was as I was reading through, I uh, my my mind was drawn towards a new theme, uh, and and I decided that was something that I think I should talk about, uh, just to share with you in case this is something that you've also missed as you've been reading through the story of David. So jumping right into it, um, David today, he's remembered as a great king of Israel. Uh, king David was actually the king that all other kings were compared to. He was the measuring uh, stick, as as it's described, uh, of, of the kings of Israel. David was also remembered as a powerful warrior. He was someone who took down the mighty Goliath and he led his armies in victory over his enemies. But that's not how... David always started as. When I look at, at someone like King David, the mighty king, the righteous king, I, I feel so small in comparison. I feel unqualified for whatever God has called me to do, whatever God's called me to be. But that's not how David started. And that's really where I want to take uh, this time here today is looking at David at the beginning. When we first meet David in the story, it's on page 146, and he's tending to his father's sheep while all of his other brothers are being evaluated by, uh, by uh, Samuel to be the next king over Israel. And part of me has to wonder, did David know that, that Samuel was even there? Well, he may have. He may not have, but were his brothers also supposed to be tending sheep? Did someone come get them and say, we need you to come? Uh, someone is, is here to appoint one of you as the next king. Also, David, you stay here. I'm not really sure what happens there. It doesn't really get into the detail too, too much. But all I know is that David was not even considered a possibility by Jesse, and by his brothers. And here's why. Um, that there's this, there's this culture in Israel at the time, uh, and, and there's a term for it called primogeniture is a big fancy word, uh, but, but what it means is that the oldest son would be favored. Uh, the oldest son would be the one who would receive the father's blessing, and he was also the one who would receive the lion's share of the inheritance. But this wasn't just because he was the oldest and he was, you know, loved more or whatever. It was because of this role of primogeniture, because this was a society with a patriarch, this is a society where uh, the oldest male would care for the rest of the family. And the family wasn't just wife and kids. The family was, uh, you know, your cousins. It was brothers and sisters. It was, it was an extended family. And the patriarch was responsible for their well-being, for their care. So when the patriarch would pass away, it was the oldest son's responsibility as the next patriarch to step up. And because of that, primogeniture uh, was a way of ensuring that this oldest son would be adequately prepared to lead. They would have the blessing of the father and they would have uh, the majority of the wealth of the father so that they could continue to care for the rest of the family. And Lord forbid if something were to happen to the oldest, then it would be the next oldest, and then it would be the next oldest after that, and it would continue on uh, until 
there was a male who survives and is able to lead as the next patriarch. But David was the eighth son. The chances of his other brothers having some tragedy happen to them and he becoming the next patriarch, it, it was so, so low. The chances of that happening were almost impossible. And David wasn't expected to be a leader. He wasn't expected to lead his family. He wasn't expected to even amount to anything of any real importance. And that was just part of the culture, of this primogeniture. And yet, it was God who chose David to be the next king in Israel. This is a... Uh, this is a theme that you kind of see throughout scripture. In this section here, um, God rejects the first seven sons of Jesse, and he appoints the lowest son to the highest position in Israel. Uh, we can see in scripture how when God says that he, uh, he humbles the proud, and how he raises up the humble, how how the humble are exalted, and the exalted are humbled. And we see this in, uh, in the case of David and other places as well, where there is this reversal primogeniture. And it's the lowest, it's the least that is used for some of the greatest and most spectacular moments. Uh, and there's a similar case of this as well with the story of Joseph, just as another example. But... Uh, Despite this reversal primogeniture, David still lives as an underdog for many moments of his life. We see uh, this moment where he's appointed as king. He was completely ignored by his father and by his brothers. He wasn't considered to be an option as the next king. We also see in... Uh, you know, David, he came to the battlefield against Goliath only because he was serving as a delivery boy. He wasn't there as a soldier. He wasn't a mighty warrior. He was just a boy who cared for sheep. And in reality, this young man would become a powerful warrior, but first he was a delivery boy, part-time as a shepherd. We also see David was on the run as a fugitive. He was running for his life, and he's actually fleeing for his life several points throughout his life. Uh, throughout the story of David, he's frequently on the run. But he became king. And God chose David, not because of David's qualifications, not because he was the oldest or the strongest or he was the one who was the best natural leader. His oldest brother would have been trained to be a leader because that was his expectation. And David never deserved to be chosen, really. We often say that David was chosen to be king because he was a man after God's own heart. But I don't think that's true. I don't think that that is why David was chosen. I don't think David was chosen because he went after God's heart. I believe that David was appointed king because God chose him to be king. David couldn't have done anything to deserve to be chosen. None of us can act a certain way or live a certain way to gain that kind of favor from God. That's, that's like trying to earn your way to something that you don't deserve. David couldn't have earned his way to be the king of Israel. Yes, it does say that David was a man after God's own heart, and it does say that you know, there was this relationship. God loved David. Of course he did. But 
that's not why he was appointed king. He was appointed because God chose him. David was far from perfect, and he makes so many mistakes in his life. But God still chose him, and he still played an important role in the story. God makes a covenant with David, and he promises that there will always be one of his descendants on the throne. And that promise, of course, is fulfilled in its ultimate form with Jesus. And I believe that, like David, God has called each and every one of us to a higher purpose, not because we deserve it, but because he chose us. He loves us. And he wants us to be involved in his story. And I believe that is why he called David to be king and why he's called each and every one of us to something far greater than we could ever do by our own strength. And that's really my thought for today. I want to wrap up here now. So thank you for listening. I hope that uh, it, this gets you thinking about how God is moving in the story as well as how he can be moving in your own life each and every single day. Until next time, God bless.